Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Gia. I am a 26 year old lady who lives in my mom's basement. If you hear hysterical laughter in the background, I promise my house is not haunted. My mom's recent hyperfixation has been binging celebrity roasts. So that's what she's doing upstairs. She's living her best life and I'm not gonna ask her to dull her happiness just so I can get this done. So I've been DNFing a lot of books lately. At first I thought it was just the July thing because I was going through a lot in July. I was going through a lot personally and I lost a friend of mine unfortunately to a very sudden accident. July was not a good time. I was not feeling so fly like a G6. I was not live laugh loving. I was not sliving. I was doing a lot of laying down. I'm not surprised that I DNF'd a lot of books in July, but I also think I was making some really bad choices. And unfortunately, a lot of the books that I had chosen to read were books that were highly anticipated for me or they were on my list for a long time to return to. I just might as well come out and say it. I started out with The Goddess Test as my first DNF of July. Now, I just did rewatch the video that I made about revisiting the books of YA that I wanted to go back to that were pivotal to my identity as a young person going through like diving into fantasy for the first time and getting into YA for the first time. The Goddess Test was one of those books that really captivated my attention and it was a book concerning Greek mythology and Greek retellings that I had absorbed after Percy Jackson but not not in the realm of when Percy Jackson was around. Like I read The Goddess Test when I was 16. This was 2012. This was not very long into the Heroes of Olympus series, which I also have not finished. I have all five books and I have read three and a half, so I, I do need to go back and reread those. But The Goddess Test was a pivotal time in my reading experience in YA that I just, I dove headfirst into it and I read literally everything. And I read them all illegally on like my, my iPod Touch that had like eight gigs of storage, which is laughable now because there is not a single device that Apple sells that has that little storage. Me on my little eight gig iPod Touch reading pirated versions of The Goddess Test, I actually have a physical copy of the book. It was given to me by a friend on, I believe my 16th birthday, my friend gave me several books actually just random and the goddess test was one of them because she thought that it would be a book that i enjoyed and she was right i got about 80 pages into the goddess test before i put it down now let's just keep in mind i read 80 pages in 20 minutes and that was 20 minutes of complete wasted time in order to give each of the books its fairest shake i do want to take a minute to read the synopsis of the book so that it can give a more general overview of what the book is about other than in my own words every girl who has taken the test has died now it's Kate's turn. It had always been just Kate and her mom, and her mother is dying, her last wish to move back to her childhood home. So Kate's going to start at a new school with no friends, no other family, and the fear that her mother won't live past the fall. Then she meets Henry, dark, tortured, and mesmerizing. He claims to be Hades, god of the underworld, and if she accepts his bargain, he'll keep her mother alive while Kate tries to pass seven tests. Kate is sure he's crazy until she sees him bring back a girl from the dead. Now saving her mother seems crazily possible. If she succeeds, she'll become Henry's future wife and a goddess, if she fails. This book was first published in 2011. I was a freshman in high school, I was 15. So this was a new publication. I believe I received this book on my 16th birthday, which would have been less than a year after its original publication. When I first read this book, I was completely mesmerized by this Hades and Persephone retelling and about how it was about an ordinary girl who became the goddess Persephone. It was attempting to be contemporary in a way where it was renaming all of the characters into something more modern. Henry is Hades. Uh, the mom is actually, like Kate's mom is Diana. Her name is Diana, but she's actually Demeter. She's basically fodder in a way that like she was raised by a goddess and didn't know that her mom was a goddess because it was almost like trying to get Hades to break his curse because every woman who has tried to go through the trials to become the next queen of the underworld has died. So from the beginning, you kind of know that Diana had this child for the purpose of helping Henry break his curse. Now, Diana is Demeter. This is the point where I took my very first pause was when I realized that Diana had a child. Demeter had a child on purpose to be Hades' next wife knowing in the original mythology that there was a lot more intricacies and complications to the myth. Modern interpretation of the Hades and Persephone myth is that Hades took Persephone. So to be reading something where Demeter is an 
active participant in her daughter becoming the queen of the underworld is very backwards from the original mythology. It gave me pause immediately. The writing is extremely juvenile, and this was something that struck me immediately. That didn't bother me then. Reading it now, it was unreadable. I could not read it. I could not get through it. And that was one of the main reasons why I put it down. There was just a lot of talking but not from the characters. It was the author constantly narrating, this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. And Kate is a very bland character. You can very clearly tell that Amy Carter took inspiration from the characterization of Bella Swan. Not to say that Bella Swan is a badly written character. What I'm saying is that Bella Swan and Kate Winters are essentially two sides of the same coin. They are very similar characterizations in which they feel vague, a little unfinished, a little unpolished, because they are almost meant to be insert characters. They are written with the express purpose for the reader to insert themselves inside the character. Because I was reading this, and Kate was so boring, it was giving me the same vibe as the first Twilight movie, where Bella was absorbed into this friend group after barely speaking a word to them, and they just kind of over-enthusiastically absorbed her. That's what this character felt like. It felt like she did nothing, and yet people loved her. And that's not to say that that is a bad thing. It's very clear that the authorial intent was to make this character as reflective on the reader as possible, and that was something that was extremely noticeable. In the first 80 pages, Kate moves to town, meets a boy who is just nice to her and then his girlfriend accuses her of trying to steal him when she's known them for like 48 hours and it it just feels like the book should have been occurring over a longer period of time but it was happening in a span of days boring but too fast paced at the same time which is a very odd criticism to make i couldn't do it even for the sake of nostalgia thinking back I don't remember ever rereading this. Like, I know that I reread Vampire Academy twice, fully, complete. And then I reread the first one a third time in 2021. And then I did my full revisitation in 2022. I know how many times I reread Vampire Academy. I know how many times that has been imprinted in my skull. I don't remember ever rereading The Goddess Test. So this was a true blind revisitation where I didn't remember anything other than her name was Kate, and his name was Henry, and that's all I remembered. I wanted it to be a revisitation of something that I had read when I was in my youth, and it unfortunately didn't even remotely live up to any of my nostalgia. It's permanently in the DNF pile. The next two books I DNF'd back to back. Also keep in mind, this was after I had just finished Empress of All Seasons, Atlas Paradox, Between Despair and Hope, and Belladonna, which were all very highly rated books by me that were all in the four to five star range so then to have two books back to back that were extremely disappointing was disheartening to say the least the first one was blade breaker by victoria aviard i am heartbroken to have to admit that i could not get through this book i read the first one i read it three and a half stars i thought that it did a lot with its world building but it had the perspectives of at least six people and that was a lot to handle, especially when they all started to blur together. I was more interested in the side characters and in the villains than I was in the main principal cast, and that's a huge problem. I did not find Corrine and Andre, the two main characters and the two like principal love interest. They were white bread, lightly toasted, nothing remotely intriguing about them. And I think that that is a very clear disservice to the characterization of Corrine that Victoria Aveyard is trying to present this daughter of a lost royal bloodline that is trying to live up to the expectation of being descended from greatness and her father being as, as important as he was and as her uncle is the villain, like her father's twin brother is the villain and having to confront that, like the ghosts of not only her past but her family and having to live up to certain expectations as just a normal 17 year old girl i feel like that could have been a lot more interesting than it was presented andre again was also not interesting he was a lone survivor of a mass casualty event who loved his mom and hid a sword under his bed and now he's on an adventure i was not interested in him i was interested in sorasa who was a 
assassin who was previously part of the Assassin's Guild, who is now on the run. She is being hunted down. What is keeping her in this situation? What is what is keeping her here? If you are really into irredeemable villains, you will like this because you have one that is just trying to take over the world and in multiple dimensions, and then you have another who is a colonizer. I mean, really, it's a match made in heaven. This book was tailor-made to be something that I would enjoy, but I just couldn't get through it. I got so bored. I think maybe I got through 30% of the audiobook before I was like, you know what? I don't want to read this anymore. Like, I was already struggling to pick the book up because I got through the first one and I liked it, but I only rated it three and a half stars. So, like, I was excited to get into the second one but I wasn't very excited to pick it up and that should have been my first clue. The summary of Blade Breaker is fighting beside her band of unlikely companions Corrine is learning to embrace her ancient lineage and wield her father's powerful sword but while she successfully closed one of the spindles her journey is far from over. Queen Arida's army marches across Allward with her consort Terastan right beside them opening more portals into nightmarish worlds raising kingdoms to the ground. Corrine has no choice but to assemble an army of her own if she's to save the realm as she knows it. The perilous lands await her and the companions, and they face assassins, otherworldly beasts, and tempestuous seas, all as they rally a divided ward to fight behind them. But Terastan has unleashed an evil far more wicked than his corpse armies. Something deadly waits in the shadows, something that might consume the world before there's any hope for victory. This should have been much more interesting than it was, because I was fucking bored. I feel like much more, I mean, maybe it's because I stopped before it got interesting, but I should not have been getting through 30 to 40% of a book and I am not hooked yet. In a fantasy, I should not have to go through 30% of a book in order to finally become interested because at that point, it's just like exposition. Why am I still experiencing expository writing 30% into a sequel? It doesn't make any sense to me. I think I just need to admit that Victoria Aveyard is not for me. I know that Realm Breaker was her entrance into adult fantasy. The only other book I've read by Victoria Aveyard is not just Realm Breaker, but Red Queen, which I have also had several issues with, and I still do intend to do a full review on Red Queen. I'm just not prioritizing it because I own the book, so I can do it at any time, but I did buy the book secondhand several years ago, so I have it. I would like to do a comparison video between Red Queen and Red Rising. That is something that I have been thinking about. I don't think that this author is for me. I have struggled with her writing. Now this is the third book that I've read by her or tried to read by her, and it has not worked for me, so I will be putting anything by her back on the shelf, which sucks, but I think you have to admit that sometimes. The next book that I DNF'd was the one immediately after, and I DNF'd it at almost about the same point, but Queen of the Tearling by Erica Johansson. I am so sad that I DNF'd this because it was recommended to me by a friend, and I did that whole, you know, 12 recommendations by my friends, you know, one for each month, and I intended to read this book a long time ago. I intended to read this book back in, like, February, and I never got around to it, so when I finally got around to it in July, I was extremely disappointed. I found the characters to be extremely dry. There was hardly any dialogue. It just felt like a lot of, again, showing and very little telling, which I understand some people prefer show not tell or there's too much talking. This was just too much. This happened and then this happened and then this happened, but it was like every step that their horse took in the woods on the way to where they were going was documented. I don't need to read this book like I'm watching a movie where every word on the page is another hoof in the dirt. It just, it drives me nuts. It's not that I want something to be extremely fast paced. It's not that I don't want something that really gets into a scene into the nitty gritty. It's just that I don't want it in that sort of a micro scale. If I want to watch a movie, I would watch a movie. Another thing that pissed me off, frankly, about this book is that I didn't understand when it was taking place and I was extremely confused as to the world building. The world building was extremely chaotic. The girl's name was Kelsey Raleigh Glenn. Glenn, that's your princess. That's your princess's name. And they are on their way to New London. We are transported back into a feudal medieval society going to New London. So this book obviously takes place in the future, but we have gone backwards. I understand that that is not an uncommon thing that is presented in 
dystopia. It is not uncommon for dystopian societies to return to monarchy. I wish that that wasn't the default setting in this sort of governmental style where one person is responsible for everything, the kind of absolute power in a time when there's so much chaos, people almost crave that absolutism. One person decides what happens and we all follow what they say. There's like very little thinking into what is going on around you because the individual people are focused more on survival. It's not something that I believe is unrealistic. It's just that it pissed me off because it didn't talk about anything that happened before. Like, how did we get to this point? Very annoying because I didn't know what happened, how we got here, what's going on. And then this book was revealed to be explained to me as a recommendation by Emma Watson as feminist Game of Thrones. And that's when everything made sense to me. I'm going to try to articulate my thoughts in such a way that this doesn't come out as complete nonsense, but to hear this explained as feminist Game of Thrones by Emma Watson of all people, that vibe gives me a similar feeling as to white celebrities saying it's so easy to buy sustainably, just be rich. That empty sentiment rings just as hollow as this girl bossification of a future medieval yet feudal society that we know absolutely nothing about but she is the queen we will listen to her she has nothing to prove she is just she's the queen now we will unabashedly bow to her because in this world not only does sexism not exist misogyny doesn't either and we will put our future in the hands of a 19 year old girl who was raised in complete obscurity and isolation and who has no experience in politics. Rich white celebrities say, it's so easy to be sustainable, just be rich. For this girl, it's, it's so easy to be queen, just be born queen. There are, at the point that I got into this book, there was at no point where this girl was asked to prove herself. Like we know in canon, she has no political experience. All she knows is history. She wasn't taught anything about current events, current politics, current nations, nothing. All she learned about was history, but yet everybody puts their fate in this girl's hands and they all just listen to her. I hope that that makes a little bit of sense. This book is what I would also describe as a Anglophile's fetish for a new world in which it's the, like the main central conflict is giving England versus France principal antagonist is called the Red Queen and she is just her whole identity is that she's french you know how that you see that meme that says laughs in spanish this is being evil in french that's her main personality trait is that she's hot french and evil the way that we are introduced to this antagonist is when this antagonist r words a enslaved person and makes a comment about their skin color and makes comments about their physical appearance and their sexual prowess, and it's very racist. Then there was another scene where Kelsey, the new queen, who is a 19-year-old woman, says in canon that she meets her first person of color, and her first reaction is to be afraid. Again, extremely racist. I had to put this book down, despite my friend recommending it with the best intentions, saying that this was one of her favorites when she was a teenager. Unfortunately, I cannot stomach this as a 26-year-old woman who saw many faults with this and like could not continue. I think I stopped at again about the anywhere between 20 to 30 percent. I don't even think I got further than I did with Blade Breaker. I think I stuck it out with Blade Breaker a little bit more. Having DNF'd two books like that back to back, I was very disheartened. Not to spoil it, but this book has been out since you know 2014. To find out that the whole series ended with the and it was just a dream. Outside of The Princess Bride, I have never seen that stereotype and that trope put into a fantasy. I'm so glad that I put this book down because I would be pissed if I got through all of that and read that. This next one was the fastest DNF I have ever done, but it was Neon Gods by Katie Robert. I DNF'd this book at I am not shitting you 4%. Let me read you the synopsis of Neon Gods, which will probably be longer than me explaining the scene and goings-on that made me stop the book entirely. He was supposed to be a myth, 
From the moment I crossed the river Styx and fell under his dark spell, he was quite simply mine. Society darling Persephone Dimitriou plans to flee the ultra-modern city of Olympus and start over far from the backstabbing politics of the Thirteen Houses. But all that's ripped away from her when her mother ambushes her with an engagement to Zeus, the dangerous power behind the glittering city's dark facade. With no options left, Persephone flees to the forbidden Undercity and makes a devil's bargain with a man she once believed was a myth, a man who awakens her to a world she never knew existed. Hades has spent his life in the shadows and has no intention of stepping into the light, but when he finds that Persephone can offer a little slice of the revenge he spent years craving, it's all the excuse he needs to help her, for a price. Yet every breathless night spent tangled together has given Hades a taste for Persephone and he'll go to war with Olympus itself to keep her close. They're at this society event and they're like, okay, Zeus has an announcement and he's like, all right, it's time for me to marry again. Persephone, will you marry me? And she does not know this man. He publicly proposes to her in front of everybody and her mother pressures her to accept it because it would like bring them money. She wants to like leave Olympus with her inheritance and go to Berkeley. So this is taking place in the real world, but the, the Olympus is... A real city but they don't tell you where when i picked this book up and it started out with that scene i put the book down and i said i'm not in the mood to hate read something right now i'm going through a lot right now i would like to read something that brings me joy so i put the book down with the intentions of picking it back up before my loan expired but then reads with rachel did in the young gods video and i was like i'm gonna watch her video and not read this book because i think that i will have a more enjoyable experience watching her read and critique this book than I will reading the book, at least in this point in my life. Tackling the contents of the book, which was extremely goofy and very smutty, but then also discussing how the book actually has a cinnamon roll love interest and the sex scenes were actually well constructed, despite being a little bit out there because they were more of an exhibitionist. That really took me by surprise. Like that would have taken me out of the book. Like if I was reading that, I would have been like, oh, like actually we're just gonna like, in front of everybody all right slay queen i guess it would have not been for me that's for sure like i would have read that and i would have been more put off from it but to find out that the book actually features again a cinnamon roll love interest and it has discussions about consent and stuff like that i was surprised that she rated the book so highly despite being it kind of goofy hi however was just not in the mood to hate read something with a bad background in greek mythology i i drew the line i can understand a Persephone and Hades retelling, you know, Feyre and Resand. Don't give them names. Like, I think this book would have done a lot better for me if they weren't named Persephone, Zeus, Demeter, Hades. Like, if they had completely different names, like the goddess test names, I probably would have continued reading it, but it was just way too goofy, and I was just not in the mood to hate read something. Fastest DNF in the West, 4%. Sorry to neon gods, but I just... I couldn't do it. The book that I DNF'd most recently has been in my Kindle Unlimited list for literally over a year since I got Kindle Unlimited. It was one of the first things that I took out as a loan and it just kind of sat there in my Kindle Unlimited library for me to just get around to it. So I just thought, mm, let's be a little goofy and dive into something that I wanted to read some time ago. This was a mistake. I think I got to 22% and I DNF'd the shit out of it, but A Ruin of Roses by K.F. Breen the synopsis it says i could save him but he would ruin me the beast the creature that stalks a forbidden wood the dragon prince pause okay dragons okay he has suffered a face worse than death we all have a curse put upon us by the mad king we are a kingdom locked in time shifters unable to fear our animals stuck here by a deal between the late king and a demon who seeks our destruction the only one keeping this kingdom alive is Nifane, the golden prince to a stolen throne the last dragon shifter. He's our hope. He's my nightmare. When he catches me trespassing in the forbidden wood, he doesn't punish me with death as he's entitled. He takes me instead, forces me back into the castle as his prisoner seeks to use me. Apparently I can save him. I can save the whole forgotten kingdom locked away by the demon king's power, but it would mean taming the monster beneath his skin. It would mean giving myself to him. It would mean my ruin. This is a dark and sexy Beauty and the Beast retelling featuring a strong heroine, a dangerous anti-hero, and a humorous supporting cast. This is the beginning of a trilogy and ends on a cliffhanger. Buckle up. The author was let off her leash. Fucking clearly. The main thing that got me with this book was how horrible the writing was. Because I was like, okay, fantasy, shifters, unable to shift. So it's a shifter fantasy romance okay i've been in this place before this is not uncharted territory for me dragons 
Okay, so there's shifters. So are they, you know, what type of shifters? And then there's a dragon prince. He's a beast stalking the forest, so he's a dragon beast. It was very clear that this book was written with the intention of being read by a modern audience or at least in a contemporary sense it was attempting to be both fantasy and contemporary at the same time because the writing was so full of anachronisms that it took me out of the book these are all things that, that I highlighted that are either anachronistic or took me out of the book entirely and I DNF'd this book at 20%. 20% was the last highlight that I did. Here we go. Sneaky, sneaky. Dad jokes. Hold on to your dicks, folks. This is about to get hairy. What in the double fuck? Diva dick face looking for attention. Get off my lawn, owl. Sexy time. Thank the lovely goddess, which was just very confusing as to religion. That just kind of took me out. Prime mating age. Yes, go on. So faded mates are a thing. It's not uncharted territory for me. Gingerific good looks. This was about her brother. Master of the universe. Silly her. Did you really think you could make a Twilight Master of the Universe Fifty Shades of Grey pipeline joke and that I would not catch it because you really thought wrong? Dick faces. Bun in the oven. Where are we in time? And then we have this dialogue. What the fuck? Plucked her cherry. Then we have this written about the same person in the previous quote. Delusion was strong with that one. Delusion was strong with this author. Ass clown. This one was actually kind of funny. I had zero control over myself right then. Panic was driving this wagon and it was doing it with drunk horses. I did kind of giggle. You enter this book and it's, okay, shifters who could no longer shift, but they can still find true faded mates. But this is a Beauty and the Beast retelling, so you have the sassy bookworm main character who is being chased through town by Gaston. I don't remember what his name is. It was something stupid by the Gaston character who's trying to get them to get married because they're the hottest people in town and would have the hottest children. No, that was his that was his reasoning. You would not be mistaken. As she goes into the woods to a field to steal flowers that she uses to brew into an elixir of sorts that helps people fight off a sickness that everybody gets eventually and that they ha it's chronic. It's a chronic illness that kills people that is a part of their curse and her dad is suffering from it. So she goes out into the woods to harvest these and then comes back. Nifane, the dragon prince, goes to her house in the middle of the night, scares her family, and then she decides out of her own volition to leave her family and go with the beast into the forest, into captivity. What book does that sound like? This was at the point where I decided to DNF because I was like, okay, not only was this full of bad prose, anachronistic statements, I'm not intrigued, I'm very confused. It was giving medieval fantasy but with modern language and that just took me out and then you have the audacity to not only make references to the twilight master of the universe to 50 shades of grey pipeline but you also word for word almost play by play copy akatar i know akatar is not perfect nor original and i know that akatar is also a beauty and the beast retelling but that was literally the scene where tamlin took Feyre. And that was where I ended. I couldn't do it. I was like, I'm not even doing this just for funsies. I would rather read something that I'm going to find enjoyable. It wasn't even a, like, funny bad time. And I've been sitting on this video for so long that I DNF'd another book right after the last one I just talked about. So apologies for the jump scare. We have yet another book that I DNF'd about 10 days after I DNF'd A Ruin of Roses, which was The Do-Over by Lynn Painter. I listened to this on audio, and at first... I liked it. I kind of vibed with it. This book is about our girl, Emily. She is a senior in high school, and she is one of those Virgos that has a five-year plan that she intends to stick to every step of the way. I don't know if she's a Virgo. That's just my assumption based on her personality. Emily also has the opposite problem that most children of divorce have in which you have commitment issues. She has overcommitment issues in which she is not only committing to a five-year plan, but also committing to having the perfect boyfriend and the perfect relationship, everything must be perfect because then she won't mess up, right? If she plans everything and does everything with a purpose, then 
nothing will go wrong, right? Okay, so basically she has to redo Valentine's Day over and over and over again because on the Valentine's Day the first time around, she catches her perfect little boyfriend cheating on her by kissing his ex-girlfriend in the front seat of his car. And she got into an accident on her way to school as well, and she runs into this guy who's, like, in her chemistry class, and he doesn't remember her. And she's like, we sit next to each other. How could you not know who I am? She's very matter-of-fact. She's very direct. She's very annoying. And unfortunately, I wish she didn't remind me of myself just a little bit, but she does. And, and for everybody who knows me personally... My humblest apologies for who I used to be because I saw myself a little bit too much in this girl and maybe that was part of the reason why I didn't like it, but I also wasn't as aggressively Virgo-ish as she is because I'm not a Virgo. I'm a Capricorius. What I had the most issues with is not not the main character. Her being annoying is not part of the problem. Like Characters can be annoying and still be compelling because as long as they are interesting or if they you know, go on a worthy journey, it's okay if the character is a little bit annoying in the beginning and then they're changed by the end because it's all about the journey of the character. My issue is that this book is extremely cringy. The multiple Taylor Swift references didn't bother me because I'm a Swifty, but they were kind of like shoved into the narrative a little bit so they they were glaring and obvious I mean that's that's like acceptable cringe in my opinion what was unacceptable cringe is the fact that after multiple do-overs of this same Valentine's Day where no matter what she does she always ends up getting into a car accident in the beginning of the day and she always ends up seeing her boyfriend kiss his ex-girlfriend no matter what she does to try to stop it from happening a couple of Valentine's Days later She decides, I'm just going to have a day where I have absolutely no consequences because nothing, nothing's going to matter tomorrow because I'm just going to experience it all over again. So she decides that she's going to have a day. It it was an acronym, like the day of no consequences or something. It was just, it was so cringy that I immediately like paused the audiobook. It was, it was this one scene. They're in chemistry class and it's been a couple of Valentine's days now. So Emily and Nick is the, is the guy she keeps getting into a car accident with. That's her chemistry partner. She's starting to develop an attraction to him and she's getting to know him over the course of numerous like do-overs of the day. And she realizes there's more to him than she thinks, which I thought was kind of cute but it was the point where she's staring at him in chemistry class and he's like what are you staring at and then they're talking alerts the teacher and the teacher says Emily and Nick what are you guys talking about and then Emily said oh I was just telling Nick that he's attractive paused I paused the audiobook I go to the Goodreads page I saw that numerous people had called out that this part was cringy and made them like pause the audiobook and I said you know what I am not interested in hearing the rest of this story and I immediately sent it back to the library. It was just not for me. I I, I mean, I was okay to stick it out and it was gonna be a three-star read. I was okay with it being kind of cringy and campy and Taylor Swift references in there and there was an annoying main character, but the love interest wasn't that great either. I just, I, I got to that point where it was just something that was so cringy secondhand that I just, I immediately stopped and sent it back. I was like, nope, I'm gonna throw it out the window. All of the books that are in this list for one reason or another made me stop and go you know what I don't want to read this anymore and for a couple of books it was multiple reasons for this book it was just that one scene it's like you know what I've heard everything that I need to hear and I don't want to hear anymore I'm just going to close my ears and I'm going to send this book back and I did And I'm glad that I did. Anyway, I haven't DNF'd any other book in the last two weeks, so I guess I can wrap up this DNF video until it's time for the next one. So let's let past Gia take it away. It was not a good time, and I really just needed to prioritize my, not just mental health, but my reading health. I think that that's also something that we need to be mindful of, is that when things are presented to us as either popular or as presented by other people as good, you feel inclined to try to make your way through it and read it, which is why I now try to look at the Goodreads reviews before I read something because sometimes it kind of gives me a general idea. Like I don't want to find out any spoilers. I just want to know what the general vibe is. I am starting to detach myself from the expectation that I had for myself that I should like a book because other people did and that I should finish the book because other people liked it or it'll get better as it goes on like no if I'm not enjoying it put the book down if you are not having fun put the book down if it is bad but you're enjoying it because it's chaotic or it's camp or it's like a bad fun time then yes continue it even if you're gonna rate it one or two stars 
you just finish it because you just want to watch it crash and burn. If you're in one of those moods or it's one of those books, fine. But if, if you are not having a good time, there is no shame in DNFing a book. There is no shame in going, I am not in the mood to either hate read something or have a bad time for the next three hours, three to five hours. So I'm just going to not do that and read something good. Because every time I DNF'd a book, I picked up another one right after and I had a better time. After I DNF'd Den of Vipers in March, I picked up The Cruel Prince and did my reread of The Cruel Prince. I DNF'd The Goddess Test. I read Empress of All Seasons, The Atlas Paradox, Between Despair and Hope, and Belladonna. And they were all four to five stars. I DNF'd Blade Breaker and Queen of the Tearling and I picked up The London Sound Society. This was a deviation from the norm and I will discuss this at a later time. I picked up Neon Gods. I read A Fate of Wrath and Flame. And I had a really fucking good time with that book, actually. And then I read A Ruin of Roses, which was sitting in my Kindle Unlimited library for so long, I decided to pick up something else that had been sitting in my Kindle Unlimited library for a long time. And I read The Wrong Bride. And I actually had a good time, even though that was also campy and kind of, you know, bad good. But I ate that shit up. So honestly, it was a good time. And after I DNF'd the do-over, I read A Court of Silver Flames. Anyways, that is all from me today. If you got to the end of this video, thank you so much for hanging out with me. If you'd like to find me anywhere else, you can find me on Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Remember to drink water and be nice to each other and exude kindness and empathy with everything that you do. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.